Hello and welcome to episode 285 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good, Andy. Um, all the better for seeing you given that you had some time off last week. So you're probably feeling ref- more refreshed than I am. I'm about to have a couple of days off. It feels like I've, I have i don't know when the last time I had a day off, as my wife is often reminding me. So I'm about to have a, a couple of days off, which by the time they've listened to this podcast, I will have done. I'm going up north to, to visit family um my in-laws so how how was your time off andy are you feeling suitably refreshed yeah it was lovely we did things that we haven't done for months and what we used to take for granted things like going out for a meal with a family and uh, we went swimming a couple of times so uh, yeah it was really nice to do those kind of things with the family again did you take advantage of the eat out to help out scheme while you're off yeah that's the first time i've actually done that so we did we actually ate out to help out twice while we were away because it i had birthday and anniversaries to celebrate so that's the reason i used it twice i feel guilty for using it even though it's out there and it's for people to use of course but I, why, why is that why do i feel guilty i shouldn't do right no i don't think you should do but there was a brilliant story where a, a young guy used the eat out to help out scheme in a weatherspoons pub to feed the homeless he effectively used their app where you can have food delivered to your table and had people order food delivered to him which he then boxed up and fed the homeless because it is pretty strange that people who can afford to eat out are given half price on food yet people who can't afford to eat out and are homeless don't get any discount on food which just shows you the the kind of madness of the world that we're living in so you shouldn't feel bad i don't think andy but there is something very strange with a lot of the schemes that have been going on with the coronavirus outbreak and the support things for the economy so it's probably why you're feeling a little bit guilty but you deserve it andy for your for your <laughs> wedding and your birthday <laughs> yeah exactly right and it's nice that we mentioned that early in the podcast because as we like to do sometimes and this is purely by accident that ties in nicely with something i'm going to do later on in the podcast talking about food and and how we can help others but anyway that's a, a sneak preview for later while we're talking about what's coming up what are you going to be covering in the pod this week So I'm going to be doing two pieces, and as Andy alluded to there, he's going to do one at the end. Now, the first one I'm going to do relates to the stock market and the US election. So we've got an election coming up in November in America, and it inevitably has an influence on the markets. And I'm often asked what the likely impact of the election is going to be on the stock market, what's going to happen in the lead up, etc. So I thought I would do a, a research piece. In fact, I did a research piece for IG20 investor members, and I've taken some of the findings from that, uh, diluted them down, and I'm going to do a piece on the podcast about it. And I'm also going to be talking about best savings challenges. Now, in the Millionaire podcast, which has been a podcast that's captured the imagination of everybody who has listened to it, which is fantastic, I think we're going to end up taking that to schools at some point. We've been talking about it in the office. But leading on from that, one of the things that was obviously interesting and caught the imagination was the idea of breaking down a goal in terms of investment or trying to grow a pot of money or wealth. So this week, I'm going to do something on a smaller scale. So savings challenges that enable people to start saving some money. So it could actually only be a small amount of money, a few hundred pounds. But there are some great challenges out there that can help people to achieve those goals. Brilliant stuff. And as I alluded to earlier, I'm going to be covering a piece that ties in nicely with what we talked about earlier with food and charity and how we can help out really. So what are we going to start with? Let's start with the investing piece, Andy. Now, just to let people know at the end of the podcast, Andy is going to announce the winners of the mugs that we spoke about last week. So you're going to have to hang on if you're one of the people who entered. You want to find out if you won a mug to celebrate the millionth download of the podcast but that will be later so on the investment front it's interesting that we got a u.s election in november now as i said people are slightly worried about what could happen with stock markets how they will react to the election later on in the year now i did a piece of research for 8020 investors and as i mentioned in the, in the introduction i'm going to just distill some of the findings one of the interesting things about the stock market is in fact the stock market has a pretty 
good track record of predicting who will win the US election. And at this point in time, the S&P 500 is at 3431. So we've been hitting new all time highs this week. So the American stock market has pretty much recovered now from the coronavirus sell off. So the S&P 500 is back above the level it was in February. The tech heavy NASDAQ has been hitting new all time highs for quite some time now. So it is interesting because the performance of the stock market in the three months leading up to the US election has a pretty good track record of predicting who will win. Now, if history is to be trusted, on 12 out of the 14 occasions, going back as far as 1928, when the stock market rallied, so when the S&P 500 rallied in the three months ahead of the US election, the incumbent party won. Conversely, on eight out of the nine occasions where the S&P 500 fell in the three months leading up to the US election, the incumbent party lost. And if listeners go back to 2016, they will see that that fact held true back then. So ahead of the 2016 election, the S&P 500, so you've got to go three months before. So back then, I think the election was on the 8th of November, so back to the 8th of August 2016. And the S&P 500 rallied, but then it dipped just before the election. Of course, the Democrats were in power at that point. Barack Obama was the president and Hillary Clinton ended up losing the election. So the stock market indicator was once again proven right, despite If you think back to that point in history, people were thinking that Trump would lose and that Hillary Clinton would win. So that means for 2020, the key date is the 3rd of August and the S&P 500 level on that date. Now, that level was 3,271. So that's a figure you want to keep in mind as we approach the US election. So as I said earlier, we're at 3,431 on the S&P 500. So the market needs to fall 4.6% from where it is currently to be down because we've had had a nice rally in S&P 500 this August. So at the moment, the indicator points towards Trump potentially winning. But obviously, for the indicator to be proved right again, we the market's got to be pretty much setting new all time highs as we head towards the US election. Now, one thing that's quite interesting is we've talked in the past on the Midweek Market Show about Robin Hood traders. And in America, their stimulus efforts, so now we had our various different economic stimulus efforts that we had furloughing in the UK. Over in America, they were actually handing out checks effectively to US citizens to be able to boost the economy. And of course, lots of people used those and speculated on the stock market, which some people say has helped push the stock market to where it is now, the rebound. And of course, Donald Trump really wants to issue some more checks in the coming weeks ahead. And he's been trying to, and actually Congress has been arguing over the stimulus measure. So that's why Donald Trump probably really wants to have some more checks printed out, sent out to people so they could actually speculate on the stock market because a rise in stock market is usually good for the incumbent party. But interestingly, what would happen to the stock market if Trump were to win again. Now, if you look at history, again, this goes back to 1952. Somebody's done the research and the analysis. Typically, the Democrats provide an annualized return of 10.6% when they're in office, whereas Republicans return an annualized return of 4.8% while they're in office. So it suggests that the conventional wisdom that Republicans might be more pro-business and therefore better for US companies and therefore the stock market doesn't really hold true because the Democrats have presided over much stronger stock markets throughout history than the Republicans have. But like all stats, you need to dig below the surface. And if you start to dig into the numbers, what you actually see is who wins the election has less of a determining factor over the future direction of of the stock market than perhaps the underlying economics of what's going on. So the sort of backdrop to which the person comes into office. And if you look back, the worst US president for the stock market was George W. Bush. And he actually inherited a stock market that was already starting to reel from the bursting of the dot-com bubble. So the excesses 
of Bill Clinton, he inherited those. And he had, in during his reign, the obviously the dot-com bubble burst and the financial crisis. So boiling it down to just purely Democrat versus Republican being better for the stock market actually clouds the issue. And it really is down to what's going on in the economy at the point that the person takes over and becomes president. So we shouldn't really obsess about who wins the election or not. Perhaps what's more important, though, is how they win. Now, let's say we get a new president. If you look at history, it suggests that equity markets in that election year rally 9.3%, while bonds rally 6.7%. Now, if you compare that against the general average for an election year, the equity market tends to rally 11.3%, while bonds are 5.5%. So what it means is that bonds prefer if you get a new president. Whereas if the incumbent wins, then what happens? Equity markets tend to perform more strongly in that year. So they tend to rally 13.4%, but bonds only make 4.2%. So again, equity markets prefer the incumbent to win. So they prefer probably Trump to win, whereas bonds like change. And part of that probably boils down to the fact that you tend to get a change in party when the economy is struggling. So it's when the electorate is unhappy with prevailing conditions. And in that instance, they are much more likely to vote in a new president from a different party to give them a chance. And if you think about it logically, it kind of adds up. So if you're unhappy with the backdrop of the economy, so it's struggling, it probably means it's going to be bad for companies, which inevitably is bad for the stock market. So they take over. The chances are their reign is going to have a a recession in it. It's probably going to underperform from a company perspective and therefore a stock market perspective than if they'd inherited a strong economy. And of course, bonds tend to do better when the economy or the outlook for the economy isn't as rosy. So you can imagine then if you've got a change in party, it could be a suggestion that the economy is weak, that people want to change because they're not happy with the economy. It's actually struggling. Therefore, naturally, then in the future, during the next presidency, bonds will do better. So it kind of ties up. So at the moment, we've just entered a recession. What is interesting is that this year, it could suggest that there's not much upside left for bonds because bonds generally on the measure that this research used are already up around 7% this year, whereas equity markets are up only around 5.3%. And that's based on the S&P 500. Of course, if you looked at the FTSE 100, it's still down about 20%. But the S&P 500 is up about 5.3% this year. So looking at those numbers, that could suggest a potential 5% more upside from here. It's not a given, it's just based upon history. But what it does show is that in the coming months, we're likely to get a pickup in volatility on the stock market and all asset prices. Because the other thing that also tends to change during an election period is the strength of the dollar. So the value of the dollar against other currencies. And if you've been listening to midweek markets, I've talked a lot about how the dollar is driving nearly everything in markets at the moment. And the dollar has been particularly weak And when it's particularly weak, that is often good for emerging market assets. It's particularly good for things like commodities. It's been helpful for technology stocks. So when you look at the trends that have been working right now in the last six months since the bounce from the March low, there's a good chance as we head into that US election, we're going to see some volatility and a a, a wobble. And after the election, often the dollar strengthens. And because the weak dollar has been driving nearly all the positive trends that have been making money in the last six months, don't be surprised if we see those reverse and we see some of those lose money for a period of time. That's just based on history. It's not a given. So people who ask me, how should I position my portfolio for the US election, unless you decided you wanted to bail out of US equities and exposure to the dollar, that would be one way to try and limit the damage that comes from the US election. But history also shows that you tend to get these very strong moves, maybe just after a an election outcome. If you go back to 2016, you can see it. But then once the investment markets build a narrative around that election result, then you sometimes see those trends reverse. And so, for example, if Donald Trump was to get re-elected, don't be surprised if you hear the Trump trade rhetoric come back again, where they were saying about 
the tax cuts he had previously that were pushing everything higher, including inflation, etc. So you started to get the stock market rally just after he was elected last time, despite the fact everybody said the world would implode. So the summary of this section is that keep an eye on the stock market for the next three months. If it continues to go higher, then it's been shown to be pretty reliable at predicting that the incumbent party, i.e. the Republicans, i.e. Donald Trump, will remain in power. If it falls, then it could be an indicator that we're about to see a changing of the guard. It isn't necessarily important who is in power, whether the Democrats win or the Republicans. What tends to matter more is whether you get a change of party that's leading. So if we see the Democrats take over, it tends to be negative for the market on average over time. And the other thing which I don't want to get too bogged down on, which I've done for 80-20 investors, it does also matter on whether the government is unified. So whether you get a president, the House of Representatives and the Senate all controlled by one party. If you do, that is generally positive for stocks going forward. But if you don't, then it's more nuanced and it depends which party has the more power. But I say I'm not going to go into that. That's something for 80-20 investors. So don't obsess about the US election and what will happen. We don't know the outcomes. We can't predict it. But the one thing we can assume will happen is we're going to get more volatility. So try not to be doing too much knee jerk reaction, especially on the day after the results. Because like I said last time, the market tumbled in the hours after the election. And then the market sprang. And 2017 was one of the best years ever for stock markets. And that was the year after Trump came into power. Interesting stuff. I'm certainly going to keep my eyes peeled. I've got a feeling we won't be able to avoid what's going on in the uh, US election race over the next couple of months, but it will certainly be interesting looking at that with a sort of half an eye on the stock markets, which I've never done before. So thanks, Dane. Right. We're going to be looking at savings next and savings challenges. Yeah, this piece, like I said in the introduction, was inspired by the millionaire episode, which was incredibly popular. And one of the things that captured the imagination on that episode is the ability to achieve something if you break it down into very small steps. Now, there are a number of savings challenges that exist out there. And when I say savings challenges, they are methods to try and save up an amount of money by breaking it down into smaller targets and smaller goals. And I want to run through a bunch of them because, of course, the millionaire plan that I talked about was how to build a huge sum of money, a million pounds. But some of these challenges are aimed at much smaller amounts, typically a few hundred pounds, which is still important because there are a lot of people who don't have any savings or they may be saving for something important or more importantly, trying to build an emergency fund because a lot of people don't have an emergency fund. And one of the learnings from the coronavirus for a lot of people has been the importance of having an emergency fund. So I'm going to go through 12 of them and I think it's 12 I've got here. So I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm going to start with list and rattle through them. So the first one is the 365 day money challenge. Now, this is a challenge where you save one penny on day one. Then on day two, you save two pennies. Then on day three, three pennies. So you can see the pattern. By day 365, you are saving £3.65. So every day you put a small amount that's increasing by a penny. If you do that, then by the end of the year, you will have £667.95. So the 365-day money challenge, it's called, is a great way to start people saving a small amount that can actually snowball into a much larger amount. Now, Skint Dad, who, if you've listened to this podcast before, you we, we know very well, they've done a printout, which will link to, where it has the amount for each day that you need to save, and you cross it off. So think of it like a bingo card. And as you go through, you can see yourself crossing off 1p, 2p, 3p. So you can keep track of where you are and the momentum builds. The next challenge is slightly different, similar sort of lines, but the 52-week savings challenge and this challenge starts by you saving one pound in week one in week two you save two pounds in week three you save three pounds and so on and so on until you get to week 52 where you'll be saving 52 pounds now if you do that then amazingly you'd have 1378 pounds by the end of the year which is a nice lump sum to be building towards that emergency fund now there are different variations of it i've seen one where people put five pound a week and it goes up so for week one it's five pound week two it's ten pound and so on and so on and by the end of it you end up saving 
six thousand eight hundred and ninety pounds but obviously by the end of it you're saving quite a large sum in that month now going back to the basic 52 week challenge where you're saving a pound in week one two pound in week two of course the one downside is that people tend to start these challenges in a new year you don't have to you can start it anytime you want but of course that could mean as you get towards christmas you're putting more and more money away at the exact same point where you are trying to pay for Christmas. So some people do it the reverse. So they do the reverse 52 week challenge. So they start in week one with 52 pounds, week two, they go with 51 pound and keep reducing the amount until the very last week, week 52, they'll be saving one pound. So I'm not quite sure how I would work with saving less and less as you go forwards. For some people, that probably would work quite well because they feel they've broken the back of it after the first few weeks and it's actually getting smaller and smaller. But another alternative is the 1% saving challenge. And this is one that was popularized by Emma Drew. So Emma Drew is a, is a money blogger that I know and Andy knows as well. You can see her, her site, emmadrew.info, and she claims she cleared her debt using the method of 1% at a time. So the it's a simple method. What you do is you work out your savings goal. So let's say it's £500. You work out what 1% of that goal is. So in that instance, it's £5. Then then you put away 1% so £5 each time that you put money aside. But she also combined it with ways of making money. So it could be doing online surveys. It could be decluttering and selling something on eBay. It could be mystery shopping. So each time she did a task or did something, the aim was to put away 1% of her target. So if you think of it like that, then it can be that you do a particular thing 100 times, whether it's money making in terms of online surveys, decluttering, whatever the small money making scheme may be, it could be just blogging, trying to make money. It enables you to chip away at the sum. So in her case, it was repaying debt, but it may be for you saving money. I quite like it. The next one is spare change. This is retro. I remember my dad used to do this. We used to have one of those, um, I've never seen it in a pub, but giant whiskey bottles. So I'm talking about a bottle that would be probably about three foot high. Yeah, I know exactly the type. Have you seen one? Yeah, we. Uh, I grew up with one in the in, in the upstairs. What would you call it? The landing. We we had it on our landing. <laughs> <laughs> there we go it must have been an 80s thing an 80s working class thing probably we yeah. come home chuck one peas and two peas that's exactly what my dad used to do and this thing was huge it really was big and over the years and then he would eventually empty it and we'd sit there and count them up and bag them and he'd take them to the shops of course nowadays you have the machines in the shops that you can just chuck it all in and it takes a cut but then gives you the money so that's an old version i mean there are variations of it there will be people who listen to this podcast who do things like every time they get a two pound coin for example in their change they might put a two pound in a piggy bank rather than obviously that big jar but something similar i've seen one with every time someone gets a five pound to do the same i thought that's quite extravagant i don't think i could do that um again this is like an electronic version of that so saving the spare change which is why i mention it is there are a lot of banks that allow you to do roundups on your spending now so i mean years ago i'm talking probably about 20 years ago Lloyd's did it and I remember thinking it was amazing at the time that every time you spent some money they would round up the difference to the nearest pound and they would put that into a savings account and the app only banks now are doing the same thing so Starling and Monzo they enable you to round up your spending to the nearest pound and that gets put aside into a space or a goal whatever they actually call it within their banking services and helps you to save towards a target so it's quite amazing that even though this was 20 years ago that existing banks were doing this it wasn't site well signposted believe me you wouldn't know that that lloyd's did it at the time but now even 20 odd years later the pioneering app only banks are actually doing stuff that the major banks did years ago but it didn't really catch on and what's interesting if you use any of these services particularly starling i know that andy's used them and Starling enables you to do the same thing. So you spend £1.49 on something, it will put 51p away in a space that you can save towards a goal. But they've taken it one step further by allowing you to save multiples of the amounts of the difference, which enables you to build an even bigger pot. So it's even a bigger almost saving challenge which i mean how much is that Andy? is it up to five or ten times i think they do yeah it's a, it's a clever feature and it certainly helped me when we were saving up to sort of move into our home uh, so you can do one times two times five times or ten times your spare change so that's ten times quite quite a bit though isn't it 
punchy. <laughs> it is punchy because that does mean that you could theoretically buy something really small that was just over a pound and you could end up saving nine pound 90 or something like that so you could save almost 10 times the item that you bought whatever it was let's say it was a i don't know bag of sweets or something so i mean yeah. you just have to be mindful of that there were services like money box that enabled you to do something similar with savings i say there were because money box doesn't have the savings account if you go in there anymore to be able to link it up with your bank account and save money regularly in that way but they do do it with investing but it's it's an expensive form of investing if you want to know more then go and look at our review online so we had the week challenge there is the month challenge which is another one you'll find online where you save 10 pound month one 20 pound month two that ends up with 780 pounds a year again you can reverse that do it back to front so you're actually saving less at the end. Again, it suits some people more. Now, this was quite an interesting one, and it takes a lot of willpower. And it's not as definitive how much you will save. I like some of the others, because if you stick to a process, whether it's a penny a day increasing or a pound a week increasing, you know the final amount you're going to end up with, which can be a sizable amount because of that snowballing effect. But the idea of using your vices to save. So if you were going to buy something, let's say you buy lots of coffee and rather than buy your coffee that you like on the way to work, each time you go to do that, you'd actually instead transfer the money across to a savings account. And that takes a lot of willpower to do. But there are alternatives where you just do something like if you buy a cheaper version of that thing, whatever it was, whether you're going to have a meal out and you manage to save money, then you save that difference you saved into a savings account. So there is a benefit for shopping around. You build your savings, but while at the same time, not denying yourself totally. There was another savings when I saw, which I'm not going to dwell on, but every time you check social media, it can actually move money across into a savings account, which is a bit novel. A, a very simple one pound a day. So that's £365 in a year if you do that. Another one is days of the week where you do one pound on Monday, two pound on Tuesday, all the way through to Sunday, we do seven pounds. Then on Monday, you reset, go back to one pound. So you're constantly doing one to seven all the way through the year. And apparently that will get you to 1,456 pounds, which is a, a sizable sum for something that's very, very simple. So of course, if all of that seems far too complicated to stick into a very simple process, then you could always look at things like Clio, Chip or Plum, similar apps that help you to auto save by moving money across by analysing your spending. They all work in a very similar way. We've done reviews of them all, which we will link to in the show notes of this podcast. But hopefully that piece will inspire people to perhaps save small amounts of money, but also perhaps children. If you've got kids who are listening to this and they want to start getting into savings, then it also shows them the idea of snowballing that kind of compounding effect in a very simple way, especially the challenge where you start with a penny. Very nice, builds up over time and demonstrates to them what can be achieved if they start to put money aside. Interesting stuff. And that's really timely for me because I was thinking the other day that I probably need to get back to saving and I just don't handle cash anymore. What, what would, what's going on with the coronavirus and everything else? I used to be pretty good, like the old days, putting stuff in a jar and saving it out for the holidays and bits and pieces, but I just don't do it anymore. So I need to become more digital in a, and more sort of uh, have a more of a structure in how I save. So I'm going to be looking at those and, and working out which one I'm going to do. And I'll let you know, Damien, which one I choose. OK, so the last piece is quite a short piece, really. And it's looking at ways that we can help other people. In times like this, coronavirus is obviously happening right now. People are struggling. How we can potentially give to other people without necessarily having to pay cold, hard cash. Now, of course, the obvious way that you can give to charities without actually having to give physical money is taking stuff down to the charity shops. And we've all done that for many years. But there's new digital ways that you can help out charities. And it's something that cropped up on Twitter recently. And Dave and I were chatting it through and we just thought it was a fantastic idea. So I thought I'd share it on the podcast. And as we were looking at it, there's other similar things that you can do and ideas. So Tesco have announced that they've partnered with a company called Fairshare, where you as a Tesco customer could gift your Tesco club card points to charity and enable those that really need it get access 
to meals and to food. Now, Fair Share is a brilliant charity. Essentially, what they do is they pull together all of the food waste within the industry. Uh, And when we say food waste, it's not stuff that's ready to go in the bin. It's just through various ways in the processing where there's problems in the supply chain and they can't quite get the food to where it needs to be. And unbelievably, there are 1.9 million tons of food that's wasted by the food industry for exactly that reason each year. And in fact, another 250,000 tons of food goes to waste each year due to things that happen in the production chain, like things like labeling errors or if there's short shelf lives. So Fair Share has been able to pull all of that together and find out a way to enable that fresh food that would normally go into landfill each year and reach those that need it. And the people that need it are people like charities, food banks, care homes, schools. And so if you've got some spare club car vouchers and you're not quite sure what to spend it on this year, why don't you consider looking at fair share? And actually, while we were looking at that as well, there are other things that you can do where you don't have to give any of your money, but you can help out charities. So on a similar thing, if you shop at Amazon, why not consider going to Smile? dot amazon dot co dot uk now i was really surprised by this hardly anyone i know knows about if you just type in the word smile before you type in your amazon you'll reach the same page smile dot amazon dot co dot uk but if you log in you'll see that everything remains the same you're buying history everything but if you then shop using smile dot amazon dot co dot uk 0.5 percent of everything you spend your net spend will start totting up and will go to charity now amazon pays for that it doesn't come out of your money you pay exactly the same you get the same delivery the same service all that happens is that amazon will actually donate some of the money to your chosen charity now why wouldn't you do it i actually checked on there and fair share is on there so you can still do the same thing with fair share but interestingly my local school is on now i thought that was incredible because my local school don't even publicize the fact that this is available so i've now set it up and every time i buy on amazon i'm going to send some money to my local school i think it's great i think these ideas i mean the 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 fair share one with tesco i mean that came somebody got in contact via twitter and you just look at it and think it's a good idea isn't it i mean people aren't necessarily obsessive about the points or people loads of people have unclaimed points effectively to sit there and if they have a use then why wouldn't we do it and the idea that amazon you can do things in the same way but be able to help people and like you say your local school is that's crazy i mean i think that's a, i think it's a fantastic idea and and also quidco people use cashback sites i myself has recently used it i used it to purchase for birthday present which is fantastic and i realized that i had a few pounds left over i thought well what am i going to do with that and i had a little look on there and lo and behold you can gift to charity and when you go into the charity part of quidco you can choose the charity and fair share is on there and also there are lots and lots of other charities so there are loads of ways that you can give to charity without necessarily having to dig into your back pocket and i just think these things are great and more people should know about them i mean i I, again i I have to say i I like the idea because having you you spoken about it and looking at fair share i mean on their homepage, their coronavirus response says they help get food to vulnerable children and families and of course they're looking for donations uh, monetary donations for example but to be able to help people who are going hungry by you inadvertently without even realizing as such by just continuing doing what you do i think is is important because as i said at the beginning of the podcast when we talked about the eat out to help out scheme there does seem to be this divergence in equality i mean inequality is i think personally worse now as a result of coronavirus there are people who haven't largely been impacted financially and in fact are better off and there are people who are down the other end who've been hugely impacted which is a very significant portion of the population which is going to get bigger and i think a lot of people have been left to fend for themselves so i think it's i think it's a great piece Andy. i, I really like it and i think it's something that we're gonna have a look at as a family to see if we can do more towards that yeah absolutely i mean looking at the stats on the website it effectively cost them about 20 pence to provide a a meal to a vulnerable person so for every pound you send over to fair share you're helping five people to get a meal i mean why wouldn't you do it and so i think that's us pretty much done for this week isn't it yeah um apart from we've got to quickly announce the winners of the millionth download mugs oh yes absolutely no we must remember to read out the names so the winners of the coveted millionth download mugs are Janine Sawyers, Ben Molyneux, Paul Hutchings, Joe Hayworth, Mike Davies, and Nayara Tabasum. 
So well done. You've won yourself a Money to Masses mug and they'll be on the way to you in the coming couple of days. Yeah. Congratulations to everyone who won and thanks to all those who entered. Um, as ever, you can get a Money to the Masses mug if you do something mug worthy. It doesn't have to necessarily be anything extraordinary. It just has to be something that we just happen to deem mug worthy. And sometimes that is just leaving us a stonking review on Apple Podcasts or any app that you use to listen to the podcast or spread the word, whatever, get in touch, then you might be able to earn a Money to the Masses mug and appear on our Hall of Fame. So that's it for this week, isn't it, Andy? Yep, that's it. We're done. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.